thank, thank you. And Fred, would you please introduce yourself? Whoop. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So um, I'm Fred Dejarli. Um, Wasamuginini in the Go, a lightning man's my name in Anishinaabe Moan, and I am the elder in residence with NAC. And uh, so that's my title, and that's what I'm uh, doing here. Good to meet everybody. Miigwech. Miigwech. And um, Michelle, would you please introduce yourself? Sure thing. Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm the nurse manager here at NAC. Oh, for yeah. MAT. Miigwech. Thank you. Uh, Nikki? I'm Nikki. I am the infectious disease nurse at NAC. Tina? I'm Tina. I'm the HIV non-medical case manager. Miigwech. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're gonna, so this again is the Midwest Tribal Echo. Um, uh, and we are, there we go. And we our presentation today is by me. Please, next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna go through our agenda. We've already had our prayer and land acknowledgement. Um, I'm doing the introductions and agenda. We'll be quickly reviewing Zoom guidelines. Tina will do our announcements. Um, I'm doing the didactic today on YMAT and uh, Michelle will do our case presentation if we have time and Tina will close us out. So as far as Zoom goes, we would like for you to introduce yourselves to us in the chat function, through the chat function, um, your name, title, organization, email. You can of course update your name on your screen by right clicking and putting a name so people can sort of hover over you and see who you are. We really do ask um, if you are able to, that you turn your camera on so that we can see you. It just facilitates more discussion. You know, We can sort of see who we're talking to. Um, please mute your microphone if you're not speaking. If um, unexpected noise comes from your direction, we may mute you. Please don't uh, be offended. You can use the chat and raise function for attention. And as always, no protected health information on the Echo. And Tina, if you could do the announcements. Sorry. I just learned that you could use your space key on your keyboard to unmute yourself, and <laughs> that, but it turns out it just zooms you right through your presentation also. Um, okay, so the next echo session is going to be Wednesday, May 18th. Um, Dr. Brian Grand from Hennepin Healthcare will be joining us and he's going to be giving us a discussion on sublocade. And then on June 1st, Tori and Gabriella from the National Center on Domestic Violence, Trauma and Mental Health based in Chicago will be joining us and they'll be talking about practical steps towards creating a trauma and care experience. Um, these are just some announcements about some other echoes. Um, there, the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board uh, currently is hosting a limited echo series that started on Tuesday, actually. So it started this, um, this week, but it's not too late to register. It's just gonna happen um, every Tuesday through the rest of May. And it's about ending the epidemics in Indian country. Hennepin Healthcare um, has, some, has some echoes. There's the integrated opioid and addiction care echo and the Minnesota viral hepatitis echo. I think that there might be maybe another new topic. I'm not totally sure, um, but you can go to their website. And again, if you want information, you can just reach out to me and I can send, send info. Um, there is this thing called the Indian Country Echo, which is based on the West Coast, um, but they have a really large catalog of topics related to harm reduction and also related to things outside of harm reduction, just generally about healthcare um, in Indian country, basically. Um, and our echo is advertised on that as well as a bunch of other echoes. Um, Stratus Health, who we partner with, also has another echo called Opioid Disorder Education and Treatment Echo that is hosted by Dr. Heather Bell and Kurt Devine. Um, I forgot exactly which days. I think that those might be on Tuesdays. 
um, but I can definitely get you information about that. They also hosted the MOUD Treatment Virtual Boot Camp, uh, and that was a live session, but they have a YouTube recording um, that we've heard is pretty good. Um, it's a few hours, so you can just go at your own pace with that. Um, so case presentations, um, if you are new to ECHO, case presentations are real life clinical scenarios that um, have presented challenging, complex, or new questions within our practices. Um, bringing case presentations to our ECHO is a great way to learn for us to learn from each other. Um, you're welcome and encouraged to send us a case presentation. So if you're interested in, if you're interested in doing so, just let me know. You can send me a note in the chat or send me an email. Um, this ECHO session will offer um, continuing education credits. Oops, sorry. Um, what you'll need to do is after this session, I will send out a, um, uh, an evaluation survey. So you'll just need to complete that survey um, in order to get those credits. Um, so just as another reminder to please introduce yourself in the chat name, uh, institution, and then also your email address so that I can get that survey to you. And um, that's all I've got. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to Dr. Robbie. Stop share. How does that look? Okay. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about why MAT, sort of like what, what, a, what, why one would, what, why one would choose to um, take a medication assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, I have no financial interest to disclose and I'm not discussing off-label use of any medications. Um, so to, our objectives today are to understand the different MAT options. We're largely going to be talking about buprenorphine, to be familiar with data on the outcomes of, of MAT, and to be able to communicate this with patients. So uh, MAT, or medication-assisted treatment, is the use of medications. Sorry, I just need to change my view here. Second. Sorry about that. Um, is the use of medications along with counseling behavioral therapies to treat substance use disorder. And so today we're going to talk about the different MAT options in terms of how they impact our patients and how we understand them. And as we talk about the, uh, and as we have conversations with our patients about MAT, how we try to address the stigma around MAT and to recognize how we can support our patients as they make choices. Uh, I'm going to start by reviewing some patient, basic information around MAT the different options and some of the data. I'm sorry, I'm sort of struggling with my view here. There we go. So um, the th there's three ma main medications, three medications used in MAT for opioids. There's a naltrexone, buprenorphine, and methadone. And um, they all work at the opioid receptor in the brain. Um, and they work in slightly different ways. So in this, in this graphic, you can see um, uh, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone, as I said. Um, the methadone is a full agonist, but what that means is, is it binds to the receptor and it has a, it generates a, a, a full effect, meaning that there is some some sense of being high and the and the well being that normally comes with taking an opiate. Um, buprenorphine is a partial agonist, meaning that it partially binds to the receptor and has a limited effect. Um, Specifically, generally speaking, our patients may sometimes feel sleepy when they first take it, not, not overly, they're not to the point that they could overdose. Um, and they may, um, and, but they norm, mainly they just feel normal. Um, they don't feel high. There's also, a, which is interesting, a pain, pain effect to buprenorphine. So you can use buprenorphine for pain without the, um, the effect of feeling high. Um, naltrexone uh, is an antagonist meaning that it, it completely, it blocks the effect. So there's no pain management part of it and there's no feeling of high, it just completely blocks any effect of the, op of the, op the opiates at the receptor. Uh, and then I should also mention that the buprenorphine binds more tightly than the um, methadone or other opioids. So when you take Suboxone or buprenorphine, it, it, thro it throws the other opiates off and, um, 
and that's important in terms of, of how how it started and um, and have and waiting waiting a little bit so you don't throw somebody into withdrawal. So this is just sort of a table talking about sort of some of the the how how they're taken and how often they have to be taken. So methadone is pill, liquid, or wafer. It's full agonist, as we said. Buprenorphine is a pill or a film which has to be absorbed in the cheek or under the tongue. It's also available as an implant. And then more recently, as Dr. Gray is going to be talking next time, it's available as an injection, a monthly injection um, that is a maintenance dose. And um, for the implant, it's every six months. And bu the buprenorphine or the suboxone, which is a pill or film daily. Um, and then naltrexone is available daily as an oral pill. And then also as a once monthly injection. Um, Naltrexone is actually used more frequently with um, alcohol use disorder than opioid use disorder. Um, the methadone needs to be prescribed through uh, uh, a dosing clinic, um, whereas buprenorphine can be prescribed um, through office programs. There we go. Um, so there's just also just a sort of also a graphic to explain how how these medications work. If you take uh, if you take a med, uh, substance like heroin, you're going to have an immediate effect and then a quick dropping off and then um, and then no effect. So that's kind of like gets into the the cycle that people get in where they have to use frequently in order to maintain. And if they don't, they go into withdrawal um, once they're dependent. Methadone has a slower but relatively quick onset of action and then and then a long lasting effect so that's the benefit of it versus versus street drugs like heroin is that you you don't have you don't get into the cycle of um uh, taking a reward and and withdrawal and reward and withdrawal and the buprenorphine also um, slower onset of action and, and a sustained a sustained effect so as far as um uh, mat and recovery um just talking about the different um, medications. Uh, neither buprenorphine nor methadone produce uh, euphoric high. They both minimize withdrawal, withdrawal feelings and therefore the, the risks of people having cravings and wanting to use. And they both have de decreased aversion and abuse potential. Um, buprenorphine is considered to have a lower potential for misuse because there is no high. Um, it de de um, stops people from feeling the physical dependency to opioids, that, which is the cravings and withdrawal symptoms. When people stop using opioids, they can have withdrawal from, you know, lasting up to a week physical withdrawal. But beyond that, they continue to have cravings, um, which, which can put them at risk of relapse. Uh, and the buprenorphine, as we talked about, is sublingual. And then naloxone and naltrexone. And naloxone um, is, of course, um, Narcan. And naltrexone is um, is a, is like the Vivitrol. Um, they both block opioid receptors, and while and naloxone is used to reverse overdose. And both both of them, if you take them, will precipitate withdrawal. So, as far as benefits of medication assisted um, therapy, they significantly decrease the rate of relapse. Um, they also are effective in preventing infectious disease transmission because people aren't um, aren't used in using an injection when they went for specifically for injection drugs, of course, and um, effective in preventing overdoses and overdose fatality. They allow the brain to heal um, both phys physically and men mentally, and patients are able to function and focus on rebuilding th their lives. Um, Opioid use disorder can be very destructive for people in their lives and also allows patients to reconnect with their community and um, their spirituality. When we look at outcome data, um, studies involved that have looked at people who are using medication assisted therapy, um, buprenorphine is the, is the medication that we're with the lowest risk of overdose. Um, in term, and in terms of all of the medications, patients are two times as likely to overdose when they're in treatment with medication, any treatment with medication-assisted therapy than when they're not. And then when comparing different medications, like between buprenorphine and methadone, they're four times more likely to overdose on methadone than Suboxone while in treatment. And they're four, 
four times more likely to overdose if they are naltrexone after treatment. That means that if somebody's on naltrexone and they stop, there's a four times high, more high risk of overdosing versus other, other substances. Um, relapse rates are uh, more than 85% uh, after you stop MAT within the first 12 months. So if you start buprenorphine and and then somebody somebody does it just for a couple months, the the ch chance of relapse is more than 85%. Um, and then relapse and to being on buprenorphine or methadone, relapse rates are 50% lower than other than non MAT um, treatment. So also, um, it studies have shown that the duration of treatment that is um, that is more successful is likely years. The things that predict whether somebody is going to be successful um, after they stop MAT is, um, or and even with the MAT actually is, uh, um, whether they've been able to complete treatment, their mental health, how long they've been using, the type of opioids they've been using, like I, injection, you know, IV use is, is a higher risk. Um, and we look at these things when we're sort of trying to help, help people decide how their MAT and whether they want to dose or, or whether we're going to put how long the intervals between visits and how often we check in with them. Um, and barriers to success, meaning the things that are going to get in the way of people being ses successful with MAT include um, their basic needs not being met, especially with housing. People who are unhoused are especially at high risk for, for not, being not being successful with, um, if they want to sobriety. And also lack of sober supports, lack of supportive people around them. Um, pe dying, dying while taking methadone or buprenorphine is one third um, as likely as people who are not on MAT. I've sort of touched on that before. And when they look at the outcome data, if you if you add their if you add counseling into it, it did not improve outcomes in terms of um, mortality and and success with treatment. Um, so medication first is a philosophy that uh, we we are pretty passionate about here at NAC. Um, the idea between medication first is that we don't ask people to to um, to achieve. Uh, certain goals before they start the medication. So the, the approach, and it's based on a um, basic, a lot, all the data that, that is out there that shows that, that that overdose is a very urgent public health crisis and to withhold MAT is to, is to put people at higher risk for overdose. And then once, once somebody is on MAT, then, the, then, then that is a time to, to offer people um, solutions to the more complex health issues that come up with opioid use disorder, like problems with how you know lack of housing, um, whether they um, they have uh, criminal justice issues, whether they have child protection issues. All of these can be addressed once once the medication is secure and and a person starts to be able to stabilize. Um, so the principles of medication first is that uh, people should receive medication as quickly as possible and not be subjected to lengthy assessments or treatment planning sessions or, or, or their commitment to, to treatment before starting medication. Uh, the, the, you should deliver, de deliver the MAT without, without sort of a time limit, like saying we're going to do this for a year and then we're going to taper off. Um, Psychosocial services such as you know counseling, treatment, uh, spiritual services should be continually offered, but should not be required as a condition of MAT. And the only you should only consider discontinuing MAT if it it seems to be making the person's condition worse. I, I provided a reference there. This is the um, came from this came from the Missouri Opioid STR. So as you as we're talking to patients about starting Suboxone, um, we're also assess you know in assessing their risks. Uh, at some just some points, uh, we try to be aware of their body language. Um, if they're feeling ambivalent about it, if they if they have some shame around their use, shame around um, being on something like Suboxone or buprenorphine, um, it's important to really sort of find out where they're coming at to meet them where they're at. Do they want to be sober? What is their goal? Do they want to be sober from everything? Do they would only want to be um, sober from opiates? Um, are they planning to continue using something else such as meth? 
I think it's important to sort of see where they're at. And, and, and that's also important because, you know, as we're talking to them as they're on their journey, sort of to say, you know, to be able to celebrate their successes because we have some patients, for example, who continue to use meth, but are very successful in not using opiates. Um, to talk with them how long they expect to be on the medications. Many of our patients have, a, have an idea that they should only be on Suboxone for a very short period of time and then stop. Um, and a lot of, and they've, there's a lot of information out there that where shame is actually attached to using buprenorphine. So we talk to patients about the fact, you know, like buprenorphine is not just another drug. It doesn't make you high. Um, it allows you to function and that the brain can start to heal while you're on the buprenorphine and, and that being on the buprenorphine helps you to get, get your, get the things in your life that you want to heal healed and sort of pull it, pull your pieces together. We also ask them if they've tried buprenorphine before and, and how it worked for them. That's, that is important to know. Um, also, also important is, um, is um, why they want to be sober. For some people, they might be pregnant, they might have child protection involvement, they may have legal involvement, they have, may have a recent overdose. And um, it's sort of, that makes a big difference in terms of, um, of how they're gonna approach their sobriety. And I think important to understand and um, are there people around them who are supportive? Are there people around them who are using? Are there people around them that would benefit from coming in and talking with us as well, just to understand? I, we see that especially with pregnant women and their partner who are, you know, a part a part of the decision and um, might have, might have anxiety about the baby or the ba baby having withdrawal things like that. Um, very important to us. Then that also helps the patient to. Um, have supportive people around them. And then of course, to have housing or basic re resources. Um, the, I, I, I always think that the, the, for, for patients who are pregnant um, or have child protection involve, involvement, a lot of the stigma can be pretty intense for those patients. And I, and I think having some really open conversations around, you know, um, that what they're doing, they're doing good for their good for their children, for their pregnancy, that um, and and to sort of really try and address that stigma and help them to feel not to feel that, that shame and to and to you know emphasize that they're a good parent, that they're doing they're doing they we we see that they that they that they're doing good for their families. Um, so how, how long should a person be on, on Suboxone? This is a, patient, a question that patients ask us um, a great many frequently. Um, and so looking at studies, um, for example, with methadone, uh, short-term methadone, 80 per, people being on methadone for a short time and then coming off, that this, in this study, 80% failed, failed within two years, meaning that they relapsed. And after coming off of methadone, methadone within the first two weeks is a nine, nine times greater risk of dying within the first two weeks off of methadone and a three and a half times risk of dying within the first two years off of methadone. And there was another study called the Prescription Opioid Treatment Study um, that followed up on people who'd been on buprenorphine for 12 weeks and then reassessed and then, and then tapered off and then they were reassessed after 42 months. Um, in this study, um, at, when they looked at people at that 42 month mark, a third of those people had been successful in terms of, um, of remaining sober and without any medication. A third of those people were, felt that, they, that the cravings were, were too much and they actually elected to go back on to buprenorphine or suboxone. And then the last third relapsed and were, were still using, at, were, were using at the 42 month marks. So, Another interesting thing um, just to think about is when talking to patients about whether they need to be, whether they may need to be on um, buprenorphine or suboxone for a lot, an extended period of time, years, years and years, those patients that do, do tend to be on meth, uh, suboxone or other MAT for years are more likely to have depression and they also are more likely to have used IV heroin or fentanyl or over prescription pills. I think that um, we don't really have any data around the fentanyl, but I'm guessing that it's probably the, more like the heroin. So just some things to talk about um, as, as we're talking with patients about this and, and understanding this is that um, is addiction is not a choice. Um, people may choose to use, but 
nobody chooses to become addicted to to a drug. Um, and, and I think that understanding that is helpful, just like, for example, with diabetes people or, or with heart disease, people may choose to eat a hamburger, but they don't choose to develop diabetes. They don't choose to have to have a heart attack. It, it's 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 not the same thing. And we shouldn't approach people with chemical dependency any differently. Um, Suboxone is not just another drug. It's it's a medication, just like we give insulin for diabetes, or like we would, or metformin or other things. It is a treatment for for a chronic disease. Um, and 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 we wouldn't. And when people go off of it, we that's not a sign that they're, they're they have failed, and we should stop offering them treatment. They should always be welcome back and be encouraged to to start again. Also with, um, with Suboxone, a lot of time patients are like had this idea that they, that they should suffer or feel, you know, they should be on the lowest dose possible. They should, this would, and that they should, you know, take just enough that they can make it. We really try and emphasize with them that we want them to be comfortable. We want them to feel good. We want them to be able to set it and forget it, as we say all the time, meaning that they, um, they should be able to uh, take the medications and get on with their regular life without having to have feelings of withdrawal, craving, or anxiety. Um, being on, um, choosing to be on medication-assisted therapy is not a failure of willpower. It's a really good choice, which has been, which is shown by by um, scientific study to be the most successful road road to sobriety. If that's what people are choosing, and and is and will be more likely to guarantee their success. The other thing, of course, is that relapse is part of recovery. We have so many um, patients who have come to see us, started, subo started Suboxone, and then have, have, not, have missed appointments and fallen away, and then re-engaged and, and been successful. Um, as we always emphasize with our patients, um, and connection is, is so important, remaining connected. Every time somebody disappears for a while, relapses and come back to see us, we, we say, we're just so happy you're back. Always come back, always maintain the connection. Um, we always wanna see you again. And then for our things for us to remember as prescribers is um, diversion is more of a risk to the patient. The diversion of Suboxone is not, not a significant risk to the community. If Suboxone is bought or, or um, sold in, within the community, generally speaking, it is for people, people are trying to manage their withdrawal symptoms. Um, I really have not met somebody who's getting high on Suboxone. We also have to remember that patients' goals will likely change over time to sort of keep an open, open conversation, what's working for them, what do they want, what, what are they trying to achieve. Um, the whole medication first uh, approach gives patients time, time to get better, time, time to, uh, even, even, if, even if somebody's sober for uh, a few weeks, that's a period of time they're not at risk for dying of an overdose. It's a period of time to maybe reconnect with people in their lives. And even, even if they uh, start using again, that's still, that's still something that's valuable. Um, we always try and celebrate incremental success. Um, again, importance of maintaining connection. I talked about that. And then, and then in, as a program to make sure that we're attending to patients and remembering that the patients have a lot of times um, are lacking in basic resources and trying to address those needs is important. So here's just a list of resources that um, can be available to, that, that I pulled some of the, these studies from and information. Um, and that will be available at, on request. And that is it. Thank you. Any questions? I got a question, Dr. Robbie. Yes. This is kind of like, you know, but something that, um, I guess more more so for me, it's like a fairly fairly new. So I, I'm just curious as to how long has this um, treatment been around? Gosh, that's a good question. I remember first. I I should know that off the top of my head, Fred. But I but I first remember hearing about Suboxone um, in like 2010. Does anybody else know? Like I feel like it's not. Michelle, do you know? 
You're muted. It's so odd. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. Oh, no, I, yeah. Okay, how's this? Better. Okay. So um, it was used, it started being used like in the 60s and 70s just for like surgical procedures and things like that. And it wasn't until about the 80s that they started using it for um, MAT. Um, but it was used pretty, in a pretty limited way. Um, and it's, I'm trying to remember like the exact, the exact dates, you know. Wasn't that data, data waiver in 2000? Wasn't that when that happened? So I think 2000 was when it really started becoming, you, you know, when, when that, that was when they did the thing where you, certain you had, because only certain providers were allowed to prescribe it and they had to go through this training in order to be allowed to prescribe it. And I'm not sure what the limitation was before that. I'm assuming it was more restrictive and may. Yeah. 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 It was like, it was limited to like, hospitals and, you know, um, much more, much more restrictive. Um, and really what we've seen since 2000 is just really a, a big push to make it easier for people to prescribe and get Suboxone. So now they've even made changes where you can prescribe to up to 35 people without a waiver, um, without even going through training because they're just realizing how safe it is and how effective it is. Um, and there's really no reason to place a bunch of um, limitations on it. So thank I hope you. That helps. Mm -hmm. Dr. Robbie, this is Kathy Nevins calling. <clears throat> I just want to um, hi, clarify uh, one point which I, I think I, I know what you mean. There was a slide early on where you talked about um, the percentages as people were being treated. You mean MAT treatment, right? Like not yeah. inpatient treatment or that type of thing. Okay. Yeah, perfect. I think those, those numbers are helpful. One of the things that's interesting to me about when they do the studies is that is that the medication, like the like when they compare medication to um, with with opioid use disorder to like treat like chemical health treatment alone without medication, or you know you know abs, 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 abstinence sort of abstinence based treatments that it just like the the difference in the success the success is just so extreme that they 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 basically say that it's like you can't com you can't compare it it's um you cannot under underemphasize with opioid use disorder the the chemical the actual chemical effect of of the and the intensity of the the cravings and the and the risk for relapse Well, I really appreciate um, you sharing that. And and um, this morning I had a patient in that I honestly said when they walked out the door, I never want to see her in my clinic again because she has lied to me so many times and been so manipulative. And um, so now after hearing this, I'm like, okay, Kathy, get over it. Take her back. <laughs> well, that's, that's an interesting thing because we have a lot, you know, I think that all of our... Myself included, I think our most of our staff at some point um, have have been said, you know, been very got sort of upset that a patient has lied to us or been dishonest with us, and and that 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 is kind of a part of the disease. Like like it's like it's it's you know the the you know we had that speaker who talked about you know the frontal cortex and the limbic system, the, the brain, like that thing that the the opiate relieves like a really deep discomfort like a really deep thing and the, and the and the and the drive to get that is so strong and and that includes sort of like that sort of precipitates behavior like lying and sort of like manipulative behavior they try the the path to getting what they're just on that path to getting what they feel is going to make them more comfortable so we kind of ex expect lying here but it's also it's so and not it's not so much like a um I mean, because that's such a moral and, you know, we're brought up, you know, if you lie, that's like a moral failing, but, but it's just so, like, it's just a part of the disease. And, and we look more at the lying as being sort of an indication of where they're at in their journey. than we look at it as like something wrong with the person. 
if, if that makes sense. So like they're lying that probably, you know, that means they're probably not in a good space. Well, and I think that some of that lying is also a result of the stigma that society, um, yeah. And so I think that that some of that, um, yeah, that sort of gut response to be, to Time. judge a patient when they're lying is sort of like a cycle that then, and that, and I think some might argue that a lot of the negative consequences associated with drug use, including what we see as being like the ways in which people may act in manipulative ways or dishonest ways are actually a consequence more of drug war laws and, you know, general societal sentiment than they are of the substances themselves. So. Absolutely, Nikki. I think something that was helpful for me in the beginning is to just kind of switch it around, turn it from a negative to a positive, because it is, I mean, it, it is, there's a lot of kind of what you experienced, Kathy. Um, and like, while this person really knows, they know, really know how to get their needs met, you know, um, these are, these are behaviors and, and tactics that have been really helpful. Um, and so using it as, I don't know, maybe something that's helped them um, kind of survive and and get their needs met rather than um, a a negative thing. And it does, um, you know, I I think a lot of times we don't even necessarily talk about it. We just kind of move on from it. Um, And eventually you just kind of come to a mutual understanding that like, yeah, that stuff that happened before, yeah, we're not going to do that more. Yeah, and when we t- t- when we talk to patients about that that we you know that you know the, your frontal cortex and then that deep part of you that's look just looking for comfort, looking to have their needs met. One of the things that we say is you know, that's not a bad part of you. That part of you that is reaching for comfort, you, it's like a, it's like your inner child that that is just just wants a moment of relief and a moment of comfort. And and what what you have learned in your life is that taking an opiate will give you that comfort that you need. You know, so that's not a bad part of you, but but we but you're here because that using that opiate has caused negative consequences. You know, you've you've learned that that doesn't work for you, and so you're here to try and change that. So like really trying to not to to help to destigmatize them and help them to not feel so much shame and like embarrassment and like I must be a bad person and this is this is a part of the human condition and that part of ourselves is is important to our own survival to us moving through the world. It just needs some readjustment. Can I say, Dr. Robbie, there's something in the, in the Slack. There's a question about, and it just like, I'm so excited. That's why I want to read it to you. Are there yes. any guidelines, resources you recommend to follow for Suboxone prescription, um, like initiation and maintenance? Are you talking, are you talking about like microinduction? Uh, maybe. Um, so we we have some we have some resources that. But I'll, I, I'm assuming that Michelle's excited because we have some resources that we could share around that. Is that is that where you're going, Michelle? Yes. So um so we've had a couple other pre- presentations around this and um and as you all know there um, with Suboxone if you t- well you probably know if you take Suboxone within a certain period of time after taking another opiate you will be you will likely experience precipitated withdrawal. So, um, and especially with fentanyl, we're finding that that precipitated withdrawal can happen even within five days of using another opiate. So there is something, um, there is a strategy called microinduction, which which you can start it slowly over the course of five days. And, um, or the, also something called macroinduction, which you have to be a little more careful with. Um, we tend to not do that for 24 hours. There's also there's also like comfort meds, things like that that can be done to like get people through that first that first time. And we are more than happy to share those uh, share those resources. Uh, Michelle, do you want to sort of jump in? Yeah. So I was going to say, if anybody wants those resources, um, just make sure that you've provided your email address. Um, I could also just kind of send them out to everybody who's on here today, um, and then you can just delete the email if you don't want it. I think another thing to mention is that if if you're out there and thinking about starting MAT services, like in your group or agency or organization, and you wanted more like in-depth technical support around that, I think that it would be possible to like have more conversations, um, sort of like organization to organization about process. And so 
um, you know, I think uh, reaching out um, to um, to Tina probably um, about wh whatever wh whatever the email sort of attached to the echo about that. Um, like if somebody had specific questions about process with starting that and next experience. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah. Nikki. So every, everyone who provided their email address today will receive um, an email today or tomorrow. So um, you can, and I'll put all those resources in the email to everybody um, and just feel free to reach out to me for more discussions and resources. And the, uh, the other thing that that Michelle has come up with is a is a business size card that is is like sort of at home instructions for how to start buprenorphine if because buprenorphine is available um, on the street. So sometimes people if, if people can just like cut their, their suboxone strips into small pieces, they can they can start at home and so that they don't have to wait for an appointment in the clinic and then they can join they can if they can get an appointment within a week, they can be well on their way to um, to being on Suboxone and we can we can help with help them with that. I have a question um, kind of to that point. Um, I know that we've talked about this in the clinic a little bit, but as someone who isn't a nurse or a medical professional, but who encounters people who use drugs, who like have had bad experiences with Suboxone or are interested, but like hear other people's bad experiences with uh, precipitated withdrawal. Like how would we talk about, not to like convince people to do Suboxone, but to just maybe suggest that there would be ways that they could still try it again safely and comfortably. So, um, so, so we, so we, what we talk about is we talk about, um, we talk about that it seems with this, with the suboxone and the fentanyl that, that if you do this, if there's too much suboxone, it throws the fentanyl off the receptors and, and that, that, that sudden change causes, causes the precipitated withdrawal. We sort of, and we sort of describe it like oil and water. Like if you pour, try to pour, um, oil on top of water, you get that like turb turbulence, right? So if, but if you can, if you can introduce the suboxone little bit by little bit and, and bring the suboxone level up slowly and make that transition more slowly, it's much more comfortable. And, and um, you can actually continue to use while you're doing that and experience no withdrawal. And then that transition happens far more calmly and with less, less side effects and withdrawal symptoms. It's just that the fentanyl has just really changed the whole game. One of the things, you know, kind of just along those lines from like a non-medical standpoint, as I, I describe it kind of like I oil and water driving a stick shift, you know, the, the very delicate balance of, of the, the clutch and the, and the gas pedal. And if you do it wrong, right. Things kind of get messy, just like the oil and water. Um, so, but then kind of making sure that the people who are the non-medical folks understand like what an induction used to look like, right? And then what we're doing now and and why, um, just on a on a basic level, I think is is helpful. Um, but you do kind of have to understand receptors a, a bit, and then just explaining to people, like, oh yeah, we're hearing that all the time, and letting them know that like that experience they're describing is happening to everybody right now. And like, yeah, absolutely. You know, because they think that it's, it's just them. Um, yeah. We have people saying, I just can't use Suboxone. It just doesn't work for me. Yeah. Yeah. It really, it really, it really has changed everything that the fentanyl, the fentanyl has. And I think, I think that, yeah, it used to be that you could start Suboxone with 12, 12, within 12 hours and you would be just fine. And not, and now that is just not the case. One other thing we run into quite a bit, Dr. Robbie, and, and I don't know if others experience this is, you know, patients, we explain the induction and how to start Suboxone and they say, oh no, no, I'm not using fentanyl. Um, and when in fact they are. So I think like if you are 
doing any prescribing, like monitoring urines, urine drug screening for fentanyl is really helpful. Um, so people understand like, yes, you know what, you, you think you're taking Percocet or you think you're using heroin, um, but it's really not that at all anymore. Um, and that can kind of help them understand that you can't just, you know, take a full eight milligram film and then feel okay. Um, so it's just one more kind of data point and you can really show them those results. Absolutely. Well, that was, that was a, that's, this has been a good discussion. Is there any more question? I see we have like 10 more minutes. I don't think it's enough time for a presentation. What do you think, Michelle? We could probably run. I don't even know what, what it is. It'll be a surprise. Okay. I'm familiar with this one. Um, sorry, guys. I, my, I don't know how to shut off my Slack. So if you hear clicking, that's what it is. Um, so this patient's a male in his fifties, um, using heroin and now fentanyl, um, for well over 10 years. And, um, he snoops, he does not use IV, um, drinks a liter of fireball a day, along with beer on some days. Um, he is, um, on parole. He does have some legal involvement. Um, started on Suboxone, was slowly progressing toward a stable dose, you know, a year ago, maybe a little bit more. Um, at, oh, what is Fireball? Fireball's alcohol. I don't, is it like a, it's like a cinnamon, cinnamon whiskey. White. Cinnamon whiskey. Yum. Um, sorry, it sounds terrible. Um, switched to methadone during a hospitalization. Um, and really, tapered off of that pretty quickly, stayed at a really low dose, um, you know, doesn't, um, doesn't like methadone, doesn't like Suboxone, doesn't want to take it at all. Um, he has restarted Suboxone, but doesn't want to take a dose above two milligrams. So, you know, even when he was on methadone, he kind of stayed at like five milligrams, um, his, you know, he's just, he says he's, he's, you know, it makes him sick. Um, one of the things that was, that was a, that's a big motivator for him is he, he says it makes him poop and he only has one bowel movement a day. And so he doesn't want to have to have two. Um, so he wants to stay at that really low dose. Um, so no, no other bowel, bowel issues or anything like that. Um, one thing that did kind of help is taking loperamide or Imodium before his Suboxone dose. Um, he says that it, it, it helped. So it, it took care of that need to have an extra bowel movement, but he still doesn't want to go above two milligrams. He wants to stay there. His, his use has decreased some, but he's still um, snooting fentanyl several times per day. Um, his overall health appears to be declining. He's having some shortness of breath. He does have a diagnosis of COPD. Um, he's got lower, lower extremity edema, but his blood pressure is fine. Um, he won't let us collect labs. Um, and the last time we did any labs was over a year ago. And he's also like, um, managing to like not provide urine samples. And, um, he's very worried about his, his, um, parole officer finding out that he's been using. So any suggestions? Should we take the case down so we can chat? What does he gain by taking the two milligrams of Suboxone? Because it's clearly not enough to be therapeutic. I'm just wondering why he would even take that. Um, we've asked the same thing. Um, it does. So, so he, he describes it as it, it, it takes his use from, you know, like four times a day to two. 
Um, and, and he thinks that he should just be able to stop using, right? Like, well, I, I, I'm able to go down to two use episodes per day. Um, and I, I don't need any more Suboxone because I can just stop whenever I can just stop using whenever I want. And I, it, you know, he's kind of got that whole, like, it's about willpower. It's not about, you know, medications and receptors and that sort of thing. Do, is there, a, is there, a, um, is there a legal benefit or like a parole officer benefit to being engaged in programming? Yes. Is, is there willing to take more than the two, like even no. three? No. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, two, two is all he needs. Sounds very apt. Yeah. And, you know, would, I, I just wonder, like, you know, I can, I can think of maybe times um, where people would say, you know, oh, it's not doing anything for you. We're just going to stop prescribing. Um, but that doesn't really seem appropriate either. It sounds like the, the question here is what what is the benefit like 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 I think for the for, for as a provider you know what is the benefit to continuing to prescribe suboxone for him like would like I think that that and what is he getting out of what is he getting from it and is there a way to sort of continue to meet his needs while perhaps perhaps providing resources that might might um move, you know, help him along. What, um, what would you discuss with him as far as the alcohol use goes? Anybody? And like, along with Suboxone or anything like that? Well, certainly you have the increased risk of respiratory depression when Suboxone is combined with alcohol, right? So that certainly would be an issue. And um, from you guys' responses to this fireball stuff, it sure sounds like that's powerful. Um, you know, the other suspicion that, that that's nagging in the back of my mind is um, when you think of the opioid receptors and the percentage that is covered with various doses of Suboxone, it's almost like he wants to be sure he's got enough open receptors so that when he uses the heroin and fentanyl, it, he'll get a bump, right? And um, that's, that's using behavior. Yep. Yeah. So I guess my one question I would have then is there, is there any, um, any benefit um, overdose prevention or, or um, would there be any benefit just from a um, physiology standpoint to taking that two milligrams a day? Um, but then also, is there any harm to taking the two milligrams a day? Um, you know, kind of the whole, do the benefits outweigh the risks and, you know, things like that. What, one of the things that, that one of our principles at our clinic that we've struggled with initially and I think have come to peace with, is, you know, because initially when I started prescribing Suboxone it was like no alcohol, no benzos, right? And, um, and I think that that is that comes from that medical perspective of, you know, do no harm, like we, you don't want to prescribe something that could do any harm to someone. When you take a, st a step back and you look at the whole situation, taking Suboxone is going to be so much less harmful than if he was using fentanyl. So even like if he's able to, so that's kind of where we come at it from. It's like, we recognize that there's that, there is that risk, but there's so much more of a risk if in place of that Suboxone, he was using um, fentanyl or heroin. So that's something that initially we were very uncomfortable with when I first started prescribing just because of the recommendations. But over time we, we, and with experience where we feel like we see decreased use of when we prescribe Suboxone in the context of alcohol and, um, and, and other opioids and, ben, and, and I'm slightly less comfortable with benzos, but even that. Um, so 
overall, they, their, their overall risk actually, actually decrease, and that is a harm reduction strategy. What do you think is the source of the edema? And how bad is the edema? Not that bad, okay. um, but, but definitely present. Like there's something going on um, yeah. and we, and he just won't let us do labs. Yeah, that's so. concerning too, you know? I mean, I, I completely get the harm reduction standpoint and, and I agree with that, but you know, I have concerns about this guy. Yeah. Sounds like you guys do too. Certainly do. Yeah. And I think that's where the, it kind of goes back to the connection thing. So like he's, you know, he's continuing to come in for the two milligrams, which means we get to keep an eye on him and check his blood pressure and ask, are you ready for labs today? And like, without that, we would go, you know, weeks or months without seeing him. Um, so yeah, it's a tough one. I, yeah, I think that I think also something that I found in all the areas of, of um, my work at, you know, at NAC is is like it, it's that question of like, and I think that it's, it's a case by case thing. It's like sometimes when you provide people alternatives to going to the ER or stuff like that, you're you there's an enabling aspect. So like it's like you, it's a very fine line to walk sometimes. I think that in I think that what Michelle has been kind of talk about in this case is like we feel that the, if we did not this the, this opportunity for connection I think is particularly important for this individual I think as providers as medical providers we also have that feeling of like um some sometimes it's just important to say no you need to go to the ER you know um that I can't prescribe give you an antibiotic to see you through because really you need to go to the ER so I think I think that's kind of the discomfort that I'm sensing from you Kathy that um that feeling like there's something really seriously going on with this person that is potentially being attenuated. Um, and we, we feel that we feel that too. And it's, it's a, we're walking a fine line here. Yeah. It's a, it's a great case though, to, to make the point um, about being there for people when they need you, because, you know, who knows at what point he's going to have a scare and you guys are probably the ones he's going to come to. And but, it's good. You'll be there to pick up the pieces and take care of him. And and to also not forget to let him know what the potential consequences of not having his labs drawn, of not of not um, not finding out what's going on with them. Like and and as much you know, like like this could be something that could be the end of you. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kidney function has it keeps popping in the back of my mind. Like, what's going on with his kidneys and. And you know, with that amount of alcohol, what is that? Where's his liver at? Yeah. Where's his liver at? Yeah, these are really important things to know. And and I think these are explicit conversations that we've we've had. Yeah, I'm sure you have. <laughs> I'm very confident. <laughs> Thanks for bringing him forward, Michelle. Absolutely. Um, so any last questions? We're over time. Thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. Uh, Tina? What? On May 18th, and Dr. Grant will be talking about sublocate. Which is an extended for release. That it is an injectable monthly suboxone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Robbie.